just very briefly, uh, this is our fourth uh, seminar in neurophilosophy uh, of free will. Uh, and we expect to have more of those as part of the Neurophilosophy of Free Will uh, initiative that we have uh, funded by the John Templeton Foundation and the Fetzer Institute. And uh, today we have Marie-Christine Mitzi as our moderator, and I'll just pass it on to her from now on. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ori. Today, we're going to have a very brief introduction at the beginning before moving on to our topic of the day. So I'll introduce myself before I introduce our speakers. My name is Marie-Christine Nitzi. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Dartmouth College and in the Brain Institute at Chapman University. And today is my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers uh, in a moment once I tell you the topic of the day. So for today, we're going to discuss the powers and limits of neuroscience research paradigms on action and free will. And our two speakers joining us today are gonna to be John Estad and Manuel Vargas. Let me introduce them now. John is professor of neurobiology. He received his bachelor from State University of New York at Buffalo and a PhD in neurobiology from Harvard University. He did his postdoctoral training with John Mumsell at Bayer College of Medicine before joining the faculty at Harvard Medical School in 1996, where he's currently professor of neurobiology. He is a former fellow at the Mainline Foundation and is currently the director of the PhD program in neuroscience at Harvard. John's lab studies decision making in the brain, most recently focusing on how the brain governs decisions to move the body. And our second speaker today is Manuel Vargas, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of California, San Diego. He's one of the co-authors of Four Views on Free Will, a co-editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook on Moral Psychology, and the author of Building Better Beings, A Theory of Moral Responsibility, which won the American Philosophical Association's Book Prize in 2015. In conjunction with Santiago Amaya at the University de las Andes, Vargas co-directs the Latin Free Will Project, which aims to foster philosophical work on free will, agency, and responsibility in Latin America. Now, a little bit of organization of what today is going to look like. The, today's event has two parts. Our speakers are going to introduce their work each in turn, and then for about an hour, and then we'll move on to a Q&A section. Now, how can you ask your questions on this fascinating topic? You will have several options. You can wave your hand on a Zoom if you want to ask your question out loud, or you can type your question in the Q&A box. You will see a button at the bottom of your screen. And then I will do my best to screen questions so that they're on topic of what we're being discussed and prioritize uh, questions in that fashion for the Q&A portion of today's topic. There will likely be more questions than we can answer in those 90 minutes uh, that we're gonna be riveted to our screen for today. So please forgive me if I don't get to all of your questions. I'm sure our speakers will be delighted to continue the conversation should you wanna reach out to them later on. And now I'll turn the mic to our first speaker. John, if you wanna take it away. Thanks a lot, Ray Christine. Can you guys hear me okay? Audio's okay? Great, I'll share my screen. Um, I'm really appreciative of the organizers giving me this chance to speak. It's the first time I've ever spoken to philosophers, so you know, be um, be merciful. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the question of, of what makes us move. Um, and I, I want to I want to um, start this with just an, an anecdote from when I was a kid, just to motivate things a little bit. Uh, my dad was a, was a was a high school math and, and, and science teacher. And one day he brought home this beat up old microscope that the school was discarding. So I, uh, my brothers and I, we had a lot of fun with it. It was a very primitive thing. It didn't have a light source. You had a head of a mirror you could tilt, you know, to reflect the light of the specimen. But I, I read a, a book at the library. Uh, maybe, maybe I was 11, 12 years old. I don't remember anymore. But I read a book about protozoans, um, things like, you know, single cell animals, like, like um, a paramecium and amoeba and things like that. And I, I was curious whether these things really existed. So we, in the fall, in our backyard, there was a big puddle. We went there with a cup, scooped up some of the dirty water. We brought it inside. We made a little Vaseline, you know, chamber on a, on a microscope slide, squirted some of the water in. And, you know, sure enough, we saw a paramecia swimming around. And I was really riveted watching these things. I remember it really well. Um, you know, they, they, they move around. They swim. They have cilia and they swim. 
And unlike the, you know, the dirt particles and the plankton that were kind of hovering in place, you know, you know, quivering, which I know now with brownie motion, apparently said they really swim around in, 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 a, in, a, in a purposive way. And um, what, what gra really grabbed me the most was watch, just watch them swim around. It, you know, there was a certain randomness to their behavior. So, you know, given the paradise, you might feed on some plankton for a while, and then they might just meander away, hover for a while, move up to another place, go back to the plankton. So, you know, if you tracked one of them, they would have this kind of meandering path, you know, moving along here. But what was so fascinating was that it clearly, it looked as though it was, you know, making decisions at points. You know, there was nothing obvious in the external world of the paramecium that would make it return to the plankton or move, you know, off to its left or its right, okay? It was almost as if the animal was stopping and making its own decisions. Now, of course, I didn't really know, perhaps there's very subtle sensory cues, a little plume of the chemical that might guide the animal, but it, it, it sure gave you the sense that there's an internal state of the animal, this is even this one single cell animal that gave it some randomness or noise in its behavior that was at least as important as subtle cues in the environment. Now, if you fast forward a few decades, now I'm a neuroscientist now, I don't work on paramecia, I work on you know, mammals, like humans, I don't, I don't work with humans, I work with animals, but you know, humans are mammals as well. And the interesting thing is, you know, you know, we also have, subjectively, we have what seems to be this kind of randomness on our own behavior. So imagine, you know, a human here milling around in the piazza in Italy, um, again, if we were to track one of those humans, you know, and, and, and plot their trajectory in 2D about this piazza, you might see a trajectory that looks very much like a paramecium. It's the point moving around, you know, hovering with one clump of other humans, chatting with them, moving along, moving back and forth, right? But the same sort of idea. It's not clear that the decisions made by that human as they move around are clearly dictated by this, you know, blizzard of sensory activity in the, in the environment in the piazza. Rather, once again, it looks like there's this kind of randomness, internal noise, if you will, in the human's behavior that leads to this meandering pattern. So, you know, I, I, I started in neuroscience as a, as a uh, at really a, at a biophysical level. I worked on ion channels from, from, from neurons, even at a subcellular level. But I, I, as a postdoc, I started working on the brain and I continued in my own lab. And really throughout, we've always worked on this question of decision-making. Decision-making when things aren't obvious, how the brain does that, how's the internal state of the brain dictates what we do. And what I want, and you know, various guises I've worked in there from the sensory side, decision-making, motor side as well. What I want to do today is focus on one of those questions, which we worked on many years ago in monkeys, and I return now in mice, you, you know, taking advantage of some of the powerful genetic tools you can use in mice. I'll tell you about one experiment later uh, to address this question of, you know, what makes us move? You know, what goes off in our brains at a precise moment that makes us move? And, and, and in particular, without obvious external prompting, from the outside world. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Now, I wanna just provide some background to get us all on the same stage. Now, you know, paramecium, they swim around with cilia. That's not how we move, okay? We move using muscles. So I wanna just get everybody on the same page here, okay? So muscles are, you know, contractile organs are connected by ligaments to skeleton and to our eyeballs, move our eyes, right? And this is how we interact with our environment. This is how we move. This is how we influence our environment beyond things like, you know, sweating and stuff like that, right? We influence our environment through muscles. Uh, muscles work by, they get electrical signals, they're electrically excitable tissues, and the electrical excitation of muscle leads ultimately by, I don't get into all the details, but it leads to the interaction of proteins inside muscle cells that lead the whole macroscopic muscle to contract, okay? Now, muscles don't just contract on their own, except for cases like you drink too much coffee and you get little twitches, right? That's a separate thing. But muscles rather are activated by neurons. They're activated by motor neurons in particular. Okay, motor neurons defined because they innervate muscle, that, you know, the, the peripheral motor neurons. Their cell bodies sit in the spinal cord. This is a cross section of the spinal cord here. And they send their long axons, a few centimeters or many centimeters, even a meter, like imagine from you know, a muscle down in your toe from your spinal cord. And then they ultimately, they send, they send very rapid electrical signals, I'm sure you've all heard about. Along their axons, it takes just a few milliseconds or tens of milliseconds to reach the target. And of course, they influence their targets by synapses. So there's a very local release of neurotransmitter, but this whole process is very rapid. So muscles contract under the influence of motor neurons. In fact, that's the only way our brain can influence muscles and therefore effect movements at any fast time scale, behavioral relevant time scale, like, you know, milliseconds to seconds. Of course, we can release hormones and stuff from our brain as well through the bloodstream to influence muscle. That's much slower. Now, I'm telling you all this because in the end, the question of how we initiate movement, what makes us move, 
comes down to the question of how you influence this population of motor neurons. Not only that, that influence has to be very abrupt and coordinated. Because imagine lifting your arm. I think mine was going to return to this example later as well. Lifting your arm requires coordination of tens of muscles, even postural muscles in your back, and they all have to be turned on all at once. So the thousands and tens of thousands of motor neurons that innervate those appropriate muscles sitting in your spinal cord, they have to be turned on all at once. So that's the question. We can put it in biological terms now. Minimally, what we know, because we don't know a lot, we do know that the final common motor pathway is turning on motor neurons. So how do we turn those on? That's the key question. All right. Well, the simplest way, the best understood and simplest way, and maybe the most boring, are reflexes. So what's a reflex? You've all heard this, right? You go to your doctor, primary care physician, will tap on a reflex to check if your, 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 your nervous system's okay, basically. And what happens is, imagine you tap on a classic one is the knee, or you tap on an elbow too, and get the elbow to flex, right? Now, what happens, the elbow flexes, so I told you, because the bicep muscle contracts. The, the, the hammer does not directly activate the bicep muscle, okay? Rather, what it does is it activates specific sensory organs that sit inside the bed of the muscle called muscle spindles. They get activated by this little stretch that's introduced by the hammer. There's sensory neurons that race their signals, electrical signals, up into the spinal cord. They, enter, they have a separate pathway to enter here. And they synapse, some of them synapse directly on motor neurons that then drive back and activate the, those muscles. Okay, that causes that twitch, that causes that contraction. So a reflex is exactly that. It's a reflection of the incoming sensory information through synaptic transmission back out through the muscles. So the, the key point here, and the reason I'm telling you this is, in this case, movement is initiated by ultimately by the, the electrical signals arising in sensory neurons. Now this is an old, old view actually, okay? Electricity wasn't appreciated 400 years ago when René Descartes made this observation about reflexes. It comes from the French réflexion, right, reflex. Descartes imagined instead of, he, he knew that, you know, that say you got your foot in the fire, you're gonna retract it very quickly, right? He recognized that the neurons were involved, the brain was involved. He thought it was a hydraulic system, actually it's kind of a fun thing based on little hydraulic machines were being built at that time, that, you know, the, the hydraulic system would, would transmit it up and then the, the, maybe the ventricles in the brain would pump down the hydraulic fluid and drive the, drive the leg, drive the movement. But yeah, basically the, the idea, the basic idea correct. Sensory information comes in, and that's the drive ultimately that causes the movement. Now our modern understanding of reflexes comes from really, really from this guy, Charles Sherrington, who really gets a lot of credit, I think, for, for really being, being a, one of the originators of modern neuroscience. Sherrington worked out the, the, the reflex really in electrical terms. Now, Sherrington himself was a little more circumspect about this, but a lot of followers of Sherrington and others who kind of admired his work, like Ivan Pavlov, um, they took the, this, this stimulus response paradigm to a much further extent in inter interpretation, including suggesting perhaps all behavior could be explained as a stimulus response loop, right? That even subtle behaviors, you know, you could still find some subtle um, sensory input that ultimately drives it. The idea that effectively we're a large bag of stimulus response uh, um, a paradigm. And of course, people like Pavlov built quite a bit of subtlety into that view, right? The idea that things could be, things could be trained up, right? And so forth. But the bottom line is, the idea is that movements effectively, even conditioned movements, are, are, are triggered by external sensory input. It could be internal as well, but the idea of sensory input. Now, again, we, can, we can carry this on, this idea of reactions in more complex ways. Imagine catching a baseball, you know, you use visual information for that. I sort of give you another idea of how this could, how this could be carried out. You can imagine you know, the baseball appears. Hello, oops. There we go. Baseball appears, it's picked up by a retina. I'll just give you the names are important. I want to give you an idea of a circuit. The retina we know sends axons to the thalamus. The thalamus innervates the primary visual cortex in the back of our brain. It has synaptic relays to parietal areas and other areas more intuitive in the brain. Ultimately, synaptic input converges on motor areas that they have many neurons that have axons that go actually all the way down out to the brain, down the spinal cord innervating the, the motor neurons of the spinal cord and causing movements, okay? So even complicated movements, like a, like a you know, coordinated reach for a ball, that could still be understood as a, in a sense, a long loop reaction. Again, the key point being here that a sensory stimulus is driving the movement. So are they really reactions? Well, I think subjectively we'd say, well, no. We, we certainly subjectively identify or, or, or imagine that we have something that, and this term is tough now, right? but the uh, idea yeah, that movements can be more self-initiated, right? Can be self-timed or spontaneous, right? And again, this is all very subjective and mushy and starts to scratch away at issues like free will, right? But let's just take, take an example here. Imagine, you know, you're sitting at your desk at your laptop, your coffee cup 
has been stationary in front of you for 10 minutes, all of a sudden you reach out, pick it up and have a sip, right? Well, you know, what went off at, in your brain at that instant? Now, as a neuroscientist, I can assert, and please trust me on this, that if we were to record with electrodes from your brain, from your visual pathways, that stationary coffee cup evokes practically no visual response. There isn't any obvious sensory drive from the visual system that could, that could drive that, ultimately provide synaptic input to drive that movement, okay? That movement, in a sense, is it, you know, it kind of spins out of your brain without being driven you know, overtly by some dramatic sensory stimulus, unlike a baseball flying at you, okay? So the question comes up then, you know, why did you make that movement at exactly that instant? Why not move 10 seconds earlier? Why not move three seconds later? For the baseball, we can understand. Of course, you're reacting to the baseball, right? And in fact, the latency of the movement would be very stereotyped, short and stereotyped, but not in this case. So we certainly recognize maybe even a larger class of movements. So this self-initiated, self-timed, spontaneous, the words always get loaded, but a second class of movements. And these also, I, I, I might mention them later, can also be distinguished clinically. These can often be more severely affected, these types of movements, in diseases like Parkinson's disease. Okay, um, now, uh, this again, this is, this is an old view, this subjective view that, that um, uh, you know, there's other, oops, sorry, there's other, uh, sorry about that, let me go back. There's a second class of movements. Descartes recognized it himself. Descartes recognized that there were other actions of the body of the, that, that were, in, in a sense, independent of the corporeal brain and body, right? This is part of Cartesian dualism, right? The idea that there's the mind, it kind of takes your volitional stuff, right? And Sherrington as well, Sherrington kind of punted on this issue. He worked on reflexes, but he recognized this other stuff, you know, spontaneous internal processes expressed as will, like he described it as the naive, the naive inference that can be drawn by looking at these types of movements, okay? Even though others kind of ran with this idea of the stimulus response machine, and, you know, in, in simplified terms. So, so again, the, 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 the real question is, you know, is there a way to, 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 to study these movements, this class of movements? In fact, Sheraton, in his success in describing reflexes, I mean, created the paradigm that still is used in 99.9%, I would say, of studies of the motor system. You know, providing a stimulus and having an animal or a human even making a rapid response to it, right? So, in fact, there's very little work that's been done on these more spontaneous, self-initiated self movements. It's hard. It's hard to design experiments. Okay. Now, what I want to do in the rest of my time is tell you about just one experiment um, that I think starts to get at this, this question. Um, it's, it's a paradigm that we um, uh, developed many years ago. It's a very simple paradigm when you call it developed. We just we adopted it, I should say, for monkeys many years ago. It has some interesting results. But I want to tell you about mice data, data from the mouse in a very similar task. It was done by a student in my lab, fantastic MD, PhD student, Allison Hamelos. So everything I'll show you from Allison. And I'm going to show you some real neuro, neurobiological data here because I think it helps to at least you know, set a fra potential framework for how these more self-initiated movements might be engendered. Okay, so what Allison develops, to get a takeoff on our earlier monkey work, is a self-time movement task in mice. Now you might ask, well, maybe a way to study spontaneous movements is just let animals run around and record from their brains and ask what's happening during spontaneous movements. And in fact, that's, a, that's a, a, an approach that some are using now. My colleague Bob Data at Harvard has, got, has nice machine learning based algorithms that actually track animals in real time and, and, and you know, relate neural activity. But in general, it's tough because animals, you know, if they're free to do whatever they want, um, it's hard to get um, a, the same movement over and over. Neural signals tend to be noisy. You want to be able to average. So we, we've taken a different approach to the years. We have, we have an animal trained on a task, but still we try to build, build this element of randomness okay, in, in their movement time. So it's really about the decision of when to move. Okay. So the task we do is the simplest thing in the world. It's a, it's, a, it's a task where the animal has to wait a little bit and then move on its own without any external cue. So the way it works is the animal is provided a cue. Okay, it's a combined, so a little beep of an auditory and a, and a flash of an LED, of a you know, beep of a speaker and LED. And then the animal, the key thing is the animal can't react to it right away. Rather, the animal has to wait a fixed wait time of a few seconds and then make a movement. The, the movement's the simplest thing for a mouse to do is just to lick a little tube that's positioned in front of it where we've got, we've got some sweet you know, juice uh, uh, waiting for it. So if the animal waits long enough, the criterion time, a few seconds, if he waits beyond that time and not too long, when he makes that lick, it's an operant task, he'll be delivered a drop of juice. If he licks earlier than that, um, he won't be rewarded, but that's okay. 
we want, we still, we like those trials. We like the early trials as well as the late trials. Because what we're trying to understand is why on a given trial, an animal might move early or might move late. We want to look into the brain and ask, what's controlling that variability? Because it is a very much a variable behavior. So timing behavior of this type, self-timed movements, are very variable in when they're executed. So what I'm showing here is data from one mouse over many sessions. This is the number of time, this is the, up, this is the time up until the first lick is reported down here, and the number of times they do it per trial. Not per, sorry, not per trial, the number of trials in which they had that first lick time. So in other words, if the animal licked at 1.7 seconds, we would add one to this bin. If the animal licked at 4.3 seconds, we would add one to this bin. And this is over many months and many licks, okay, many, many trials. All right, now, um, you might think, wow, these animals are really bad at timing. In fact, all animals are bad at timing, even humans. Okay, it's, that's, been, that's been worked out quite a bit in the literature. You know, there's a lot of variability when you move. We don't really care about that. The key thing for us is we want to exploit this incredible variability in movement time. We want to ask what's different in the brain when the animal happens to move early or happens to move late. Can we, can we peek into the brain and look at the mechanisms that trial by trial seem to underlie this variability? And that, you know, that's our first attempt, in a sense, to get at this question of, you know, the decision of when to move when you're not being directly prompted, all right? Now, something I should mention is the wait time, the very important time thing here is the wait time, a few seconds, is an eternity for the, for, for, for the, for the nervous system. And that is, again, again I'm going to assert that sensory cues, sensory responses to the cue, they dissipate in a few hundred milliseconds at most. So we, the key is to make it, make it last much longer, the waiting period, such that, again, the animal has to somehow, you know, uh, um, rev up the movement on its own without this external sensory drive, okay? And, and I'll even show you some data that suggests that, but, but trust me on that, on that point now. Okay, well, where are we going to look in the brain? We've actually looked in a number of places, but what I want to tell you about today is new experiments from my lab. We, we focused on neurons in the brain, actually in the midbrain, if that's means anything to you, that express the neurotransmitter dopamine, okay? Now, why dopamine? Well, you probably know that it's these midbrain dopamine neurons that die off in Parkinson's disease. Okay, that was maybe one of our first hints. In Parkinson's disease, dopamine neurons are lost. And as you know, one of the major manifestations of Parkinson's disease is it's a movement disorder, right? Patients have a tremor, patients have slowness of movements, and very importantly, patients have a great difficulty initiating movements. They can want to get out of their chair, they just can't do it. They're not weak, that's not the problem. Once they get going, they have no problem. They just can't get the movement started. Okay, so we thought, wow, dopamine neurons might be a good place to look as a potential initiator of this whole process. However, the brain on its own revs up movements, maybe dopamine's involved, okay? Now, we couldn't look at dopamine neurons in the monkey. It was, you know, years ago, we had this hypothesis, we couldn't look there. But the beautiful thing about mice, the reason we switched to mice, um, is that there's these fantastic genetic tools in mice. We can make transgenic mice, where now you can target specific neurons defined genetically, like dopamine neurons, okay? So, and this is the way you do it, so with this animal called dat cre which is dopamine transporter, expressing a little protein called Cree. All The only, only significance here is this protein will be expressed specifically in dopamine neurons in the midbrain, okay? Actually, dopamine neurons all over the place, we're gonna target the midbrain. Now this, and this I don't wanna overcomplicate things here, but we're gonna monitor the activity of those dopamine neurons using, using this genetic trick what we do is we injected a, a, a virus, actually AEV is a virus. We've, we've engineered the virus or someone did it for us. And the virus is gonna be only expressed in, in those dopamine neurons by this genetic trick. And it's gonna express something called, called GCAMP 6F. Don't worry about the name. What this is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a fluorescent indicator of the activity of the neurons, okay? It actually works the calcium ions, but don't worry about that. It's gonna give us a proxy, a readout of the activity of, of the, the neurons. We also co-inject another another four or four that has a control. Don't worry about that one. It just show, it'll be the data. So T tomato, it's not, it doesn't give you a readout of, of, the, of the neurons. It's there as a control for movements and things like that. Okay, what we're gonna do is we implant little fiber optic stubs, and we're gonna actually just collect light, excite and collect light from those neurons, either from the cell bodies and in the midbrain with their targets and the striatum, that's not important. We're gonna collect light, and what you get then is a, a tra an optical trace which is capturing the activity probably of hundreds of dopamine neurons simultaneously, okay? And as well as this control trace from this TD tomato floor. Don't, don't worry about that, okay? This GCAMP 6F trace, again, it's gonna be a, a readout of the activity of those dopamine neurons. Okay, so what do you find? Here's our hypothesis. Let's go back to this, you know, this big, broad distribution of movement times. Based on Parkinson's disease and many other things, we might hypothesize that when dopamine happens to be high 
Okay, we might imagine dopamine levels are fluctuating from moment to moment. If they happen to be high, that might engender a fast movement, like, you know, 1.3 seconds here. Whereas if dopamine's low, perhaps our hypothesis would be that you might have a much, low, much, a much slower movement time. So we're hypothesizing that by monitoring the dopamine signal, we can predict trial by trial, we can explain this variability in the movement time. Okay? Now, what do you find? So here's a recording from one session from one mouse, and the data are aligned in different ways. Here's, here's the Q onset. Of, there's a Q, they almost the weight, and there's a first lift. And it's, and it's random from trial to trial, so we align those data and we average either on the Q onset or on the first lift. So look at the Q onset. There's a little, little stubby response here, and that's found all over the brain. Lots of things respond to Q onsets, but notice it subsides in just a couple hundred milliseconds. This backs up my point that in this task, there's not a lingering sensory response. It comes and it goes. Okay, way before the movement has occurred seconds later. And then around the time of movement, at time zero here, there's also a, a, a second big burst of activity, this kind of spike here. And that was also well known, dopamine neurons, a lot of folks have found now that dopamine neurons tend to have, again, little bursts of activity right around the times of movement. But here's the cool thing. Look at the lead up to that movement. Looking back seconds in time, there's a slow increase, we call it a ramp of activity up towards that movement time. In, in this collection of dopamine neurons, as if they're, they're slowly building them, building up activity, revving themselves up, or the brain's revving them up, right, towards that movement time, okay? So that, that was pretty interesting because this looks as though it maybe in some ways it's predictive of the upcoming movement time. And we did exactly that. We took all these data, these are all lumped together, and we broke up the trials by when the animal moved. So we're going to average trials based on long movements shown here. So here's a case where, on average, we took out the trials from this session, and they randomly interleaved, right? When the animal moved, at, I don't know, 3.5 seconds or so on average. And look how slow the ramp up is in this case. It, it slowly ramps up from the early part of the trial all the way over seconds towards that point. Let's instead let's focus on the trials where the animal moved very early, in one second. These are, again, these are randomly interleaved with the long trials. Look at this. If the animal chose to move early here, there's a similar ramp, but it's much faster in this case. It ramps up faster, more steeply. And if you look at intermediate times, two seconds or 2.75 seconds, the ramp slope is an intermediate slope. It's as if the ramp, the slope of this dopamine buildup, we don't know dopamine neuron build, activity buildup, is determining or is certainly correlated with that movement time. Almost like you could draw a threshold here and predict when the animal moves. Now here's average. It's really beautiful to see it in the averages among all the mice. And it's, you know, the noise is lower. You see this beautiful fanning out. Again, again these trials are interleaved, okay? The animal's choosing when to move. We simply select and average those trials, you know, by, 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 the, by the movement time the animal selected. You see this wonderful fanning out, almost as if the dopamine signal reaches kind of a threshold, a system, system level threshold, and then there's a fast burst that leads to the movement, okay? Just a, just a speculation. Notice also, way before the movement, right after the Q onset, even before, already the kind of the baseline signal from the dopamine neurons already is predictive of when the animal will move, right? It's higher when they move early, it's lower when they move late. And just make one last point, and if we, if we show those data up until the time of movement, and this is the control, this is that control floor, if we're worried about that down here, if we break up the data by the movement time again, right, from slow, from very early to very slow, and we just imagine there's some kind of threshold, maybe the system has to hit some threshold. If we plot that threshold crossing time on the y-axis here against the actual time the animal licks, right, just, just right off the axis here, look how beautifully that threshold crossing predicts the lick time. It predicts almost all the variance in the lick time from trial to trial. Now, I don't have time to tell you a lot of other experiments with actually using optogenetic approaches we've been able, able to stimulate these neurons as well, speed them up, slow them down. We also have no idea what, you know, what is the source of this variability. Why are the dopamine neurons ramping up quickly or slowly from trial to trial? But these are neurons now. Neurons change their electrical properties based on synaptic input, input from other parts of the brain. This gives us a handle now, hopefully mechanistic, to get at this basis the basis for this, for this phenomenon. And I just want to end it and hopefully set up Manuel's part by, I, I, I don't want to, by any stretch of the imagination suggest this is, you know, done deal. You know, we've looked at, we have evidence about how the timing of self initiated movements can be fairly random. And we can kind of explain that randomness, at least based on recording from dopamine neurons. But it, again, we're not, the animals and we don't, just don't make any movement, right? Under normal conditions, we make purposive movements, right? The animal licks because there's juice to be in front of it. So really the question also is, you know, what is the state of the brain that defines appropriate purpose of movements at a given moment, right? It's not just the timing, it's what movements made. And just to set up, I think what Manuel is going to get into, think about raising your hand, right? You can raise your hand in multiple different contexts. You can choose the time to raise your hand. 
But whether you raise your hand or not is going to be strongly a, a condition of the state of the brain. It's going to depend on context, environmental context, and, and presumably setting up the dynamic networks such that maybe processes like this ramping kind of process among neurons can drive these neurons at, uh, can drive these drive these movements at, at certain times. You know, like, uh, even though it appears to be it, it can appear, appear to be relatively random from the outside. So I'll stop there and hand this over to 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 Manuel. All right, uh, thanks so much. Um, let me see if I can do a screen share here without crashing everything. Uh, let's see. All right, is that visible to folks? Okay, terrific. Um, so uh, thanks, John, and, and thanks, uh, Marie Christine, as well. And also, I want to take a moment just to thank Tian and Uri for, for making this happen. Um, this is a kind of exciting uh, feature about this project in general, is, is the opportunity to get philosophers and neuroscientists in, into conversation. And it's been a, a lot of fun watching the, this process unfold. And I, in particular, want to thank uh, those of you who are here as audience members who willingly inflicted upon yourselves yet another Zoom meeting. So. Uh, you know, great appreciation to all of you who are, are here uh, listening, uh, listening to us talk about these things remotely. So, uh, so I want to start indeed with where John left off. Um, and that's the, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, a bit of physical behavior, but our varied sense about what exactly, what is arguably the same bit of, of, of physical behavior, at least externally, what it looks like the same bit of, of physical behavior externally, the, the kind of relatively robust differences uh, that, we, uh, that we have in what we think that behavior is and how we classify it and how we think of it as an action. So, so take uh, a case of extending, uh, extending one's hand up in the air and ask yourself, what's the difference between a version of that just being an, an instance of stretching uh, versus being an instance of saluting our dear leader uh, versus being an instance of asking a question versus uh, a case of bidding on a Rembrandt versus a case of directing someone to stop. So the very same bit of physical motion uh, looks like and can be depending on the context and other sorts of features of, of uh, that, that we might be interested in can drive very different views about what the very same bit of behavior is, is doing, what kind of action it is. And, uh, and so part of what I want to explore here is the idea that for a satisfactory theory of action, and maybe in particular for, for certain kinds of what I would think of as high level or particularly complex or sophisticated forms of action, uh, including things like free will, that we're going to need a story about social meaning, uh, about practices that endow some behaviors with specific symbolic significance. And so in some sense, this is a, a picking up the story, as you'll see in a little bit, picking up the story about how to think about action, how to think about what we want from a theory of action that starts in a different place. Where Part of where I'm going to end up is arguing that, that whether we start from below, as it were, or start from above, we're going to end up needing to talk to one another because it turns out a complete theory of action is going to end up having to say something about both of these things. So here's one way to just capture that initial thought is that it's going to turn out that whatever your story about action is, it's going to turn out that in order to account for things like involuntary bids on a Rembrandt, um, that, that, that that kind of action is going to require a story about social practices and their norms. So here's what I'm going to try to do over just roughly the next 20 minutes or so is uh, ask some general questions about what we might want from a theory of action. Um, and to ask in particular whether or not there's something about free will that is going to be especially hard or complicated for a theory of action. Uh, then I'm going to point to what I think of as, as at least for philosophers, a uh, particularly vexing set of features about very everyday ordinary action descriptions that are going to point in ways that I think require us to do uh, more than looking at uh, the brain in order to have a complete story of, uh, of action. And I'll make some remarks about some methodological differences and then conclude with a hopefully conciliatory proposal. Um, so that's where we're going. Okay, so just a kind of quick recap of things that we might want from a theory of action. So when we, when we ask ourselves, look, well, um, when we want a theory of action, what's the phenomena that we want to capture? What's the range of things for which uh, a, a full or robust theory of action would, would allow us to say something about these distinctions, capture these concepts? And, and I think it turns out once we start thinking about those things, that, 
that show up. Maybe we want a distinction between what Davidson characterized as the difference between actions and events, that is doings and happenings, between intentional versus unintentional action. Between actions. And then in case John was being a spontaneous, maybe pre-planned actions or cases of picking and choosing or distinctions between whether or not somebody's able versus unable to do things. Uh, so, the, so, and then of course, you know, the things that lots of philosophers have spent a lot of time worrying about, free action, free will, autonomous action, responsible action, and then the sorts of distinctions that, distinctions that show up, for example, in our thinking about uh, legal categories uh, between coercion, recklessness, negligence, and everyday cases like weak-willed action. So there's just a, a huge array of things that when we think we want a theory of action, all of this stuff is going to be stuff that, that paradigmatically falls into what we would want a theory of action to tell us about. What's going on in these cases? What's distinctive about them? Now, I do want to note that there is a tradition of worrying that at least in that set I just had in front of you, that some pieces of that might involve a certain amount of discontinuity. And, uh, and here's what I mean by that. You might think certain kinds of low-level actions exist in non-human creatures. So think about the kind of goal-directed behavior of ants. We might characterize that as a certain kind of basic or very rudimentary uh, sort of action. And then when we think about a certain kinds of paradigmatically, uh, putatively paradigmatically uh, uh, human actions, uh, so cases where somebody is making a de deliberative, consciously aware, free choice, whatever that turns out to mean. You might think, some people have thought, well, that's going to require distinctive features that are, involve radically different properties than the sorts of properties that exist in uh, goal-directed behavior of ants. Uh, so maybe this involves things like indeterminism or tracking of reasons or a certain amount of sophisticated psychological machinery that allows things like identification with motives or values. Maybe it involves a characteristic phenomenology or consciousness. Uh, so I want to note that there is a tradition that thinks about these things in such a way that we have to kind of capture a, a set of disjunctions that or uh, discontinuities that that hive humans off from, as it were, the rest of the natural order. For my own part, I'm, I, I think it's a it's an open question where are where whether those things are indeed uh, um, uh, robust discontinuities. But I don't think it should be built into a, a, a theory or philosophy of action that we start with the presumption that these things necessarily have to turn out to be discontinuities. So here's one thing though, one place where the discontinuity thought has oftentimes gone especially live has had to do with thinking about free will. So a number of people, uh, um, some of my best friends, uh, have held that, uh, that free will requires uh, a special kind of causal or metaphysical power that is in many ways radically discontinuous with other parts of nature. And so sometimes what this involves is a kind of view about agent causation, causal origination, some sense that we're the ultimate sources of action in a way that is, uh, that is maybe uncommon. Uh, or maybe it involves something that might be relatively common, but, but engineered up in us in a certain kind of way. Uh, so a broad form of indeterminism. Now, there are various ways to kind of soften the sense of the, the radicalness of, of this proposal or of these kinds of proposals. And, and for our present purposes, I don't want to pick a fight about any of this here, except to note that there is a tradition of folks who think about this. And I think it's, it's unclear whether or not free will requires these sorts of things. And there's just lots of lively philosophical disputes that I'm not going to try to uh, settle, uh, you know, in, in two seconds or so. Uh, but I do think it is unclear about how it would go that we would show that human beings have such powers. And so here's something that I think is, is, is particularly appealing about a kind of broadly neuroscientific or bottom-up story about human agency is, uh, is that it starts with a set of things that are kind of demonstrable uh, and then we build up theories that use those things uh, as, as pieces to grow a, a more ambitious theory. And I think one of the interesting features about some of these discontinuity hypotheses is about how we could show whether or not we ever even had these powers one way or another. And what would that mean if it turns out that we concluded that, that we couldn't show that we have such powers? I think it's an open question. I just flag it for, for future discussion if folks want to take this up. But here's a thought about why free will might be special, even if it doesn't require a special metaphysics. Right? So the thought is maybe there's something about free will that even if there isn't a special metaphysics is going to be a problem for a story that wants to be a kind of purely bottom up story about human action. And the thought goes something like this. If free will involves abilities or capacities that are in some way structured by social practices, 
or by social interests, it isn't clear how we're going to be able to account for it by focusing on brain processes, or at least how that we're going to get a direct path to that story. And here's the kind of thing that I think sometimes uh, uh, animates this sort of thought. It's sort of kind of two sets of reasons for thinking that there's some kind of social or broadly ecological dimension to the nature of free will. So first off, a lot of accounts of free will, not all of them, but many of them understand free will as an ability to recognize and respond to reasons. And it's gonna turn out that some reasons are rooted in social practices. So what is it to be a, a, a kind of creature that's free? Well, it involves being able to recognize and, and respond to certain kinds of reasons. And if those reasons are rooted in facts about social practices, it looks like part of a complete story about, about free will is gonna to have to go via a story about how humans and human relations to social practices constitute, produce ground reasons in a way that looks like we're gonna to have to, as it were, go laterally in our explanation. Uh, that is to look at, at, at human collectives as part of the story. Now, of course, human collectives are going to turn out to be collections of things with brains, so it might be that, that there's still going to be a link there, but where the ex principal explanatory force comes from is it looks like it might, for certain conceptions of reason, involve, uh, involve collective practices. But a second reason for leaning on the thought that we're going to need some kind of social component in the story is the thought that free will involves an ability to do otherwise. And here's the thing that I think has sometimes gone underappreciated. And that's the thought that talk about abilities is just exceptionally socially entangled. It's really hard to make sense of ability talk if you're not paying attention to the social dimensions of how we ascribe ability talk. And, I, and this is, goes back to the, the very thing I opened with about the thought about all of the different things we might want from a theory of action and the way in which a lot of those pieces are socially entangled. So here's some examples. So, uh, think about, uh, you know, take the question, um, somebody could just ask you, look, if, if, if Maria has the money, can she buy organic produce from a local farm? Now, it, it might think, you might think, well, we could start to answer that question, but then immediately it can get complicated if somebody comes along and asks, well, wait, is the farm even open? And now suddenly our willingness to attribute whether or not Maria has the ability is going to turn on these other kinds of, it looks like, social practice facts. Or we can ask, if Sam lost a leg to amputation, can he run 100 meters in 12 seconds? Well, it might turn out that it matters whether or not he's got access to prosthetics or other tools that would, would make a difference. Similarly, we could ask of an alcoholic, um, you know, uh, you know, how capable is the struggling alcoholic of being able to turn down uh, a drink of alcohol? But it looks like it might matter whether or not we're, uh, we've got environmental or social adjustments that make a difference. That is, you know, ha have we made it harder to get access to the alcohol? Have we surrounded the person with uh, social support that makes it easier to resist the temptation or that distracts them with other kinds of activities? Um, a, a, a horrifyingly recent uh, experience I had, a contractor says he's able to remodel your bathroom. Question, does he mislead you if it turns out he's not actually doing the remodeling, but hiring a bunch of other people to do it? Now, in some cases, it seems like that would be totally okay, but there are gonna be other cases where outsourcing would be wildly misleading. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be, th think about how a wedding ceremony would go if it turns out the person who's saying I do is not the person who agreed at the moment of the proposal. Okay, so, so the folk notions of abilities, I think, are oftentimes reflect our varied needs, interests, and goals. And I think this is why folk talk is so messy, that folk talk about abilities is oftentimes responsive to this web of issues we have about coordination and cooperation. And it uh, turns out to be very sensitive to our interests in asking and answering ability questions. And so it's for those reasons that I think any story about what agents can do, a complete theory of action is gonna to have to involve some structuring or allow that there's structuring of those things by things outside of the head, material, institutional, ideological, structural features of the world. Um, so, you know, uh, one might have a formal institutional opportunity to vote, to sue, and so on without having the material resources to utilize that sort of freedom. And I think a lot of conceptions of agency, free will, autonomy, and control have some degree of contextual uh, institutional and social entanglement. And I think that's why uh, fights about the nature of coercion, about the significance of social disadvantage, about what constitutes manipulation, uh, the rich and interesting literature on adaptive preferences and so on, why most of the folks who, who wrangle those issues think that at least on the face of it, these questions raise challenges for our thinking about free will and autonomy.
Uh, and so part of this, I think, that the fact that there is a literature about these things and the fact that, that these literatures are, are widely taken by their participants to have implications for free will and autonomy, I think just points at one way in which so much of our interest in at least some notions of agency, some notions of action, uh, turn out to be generated, uh, kind of social practice. Here's a thought I want to emphasize. Because I think sometimes what happens is if, uh, if one starts pointing to, to the complexity of social phenomena um, the, and, uh, and, uh, and you feel any temptation to think that there might be something like a live possibility of some or another version of a discontinuity thesis in the background, there's an impulse to insist that whoever's saying these things must be driven by the thought that, uh, that there's something spooky and mysterious in action production that is gonna bypass involvement of the brain. And I think that's a mistake. And in particular, I wanna insist that everything I've said so far, I take it is compatible with thinking that certain kinds of action can be understood by looking at the brain. And in particular, that a full explanation of action can't ignore the brain. And I think it can't ignore the brain for exactly the sorts of reasons that John was talking about. That is, we have these really rich and powerful models about how it is that certain kinds of actions get produced. And we're getting richer and more powerful explanations every day about how those stories go. So it's not, this is not intended as a, as a, a, a story of displacement where somehow the, the mere fact that, uh, you know, whether or not somebody is capable of throwing a ball for a touchdown somehow shows that we don't need brain science. Rather, the thought is supposed to be that, that it looks like there's a kind of, uh, uh, there's something that needs to be explained here about what the relationship is between our action attributions entanglement with social practices and what we know about the mechanics of behavioral production that come out of, out of brain science. So what's going on? So here's, I think, kind of a first pass. And I think uh, there's a way of, uh, of thinking about these as, as rooted in, in distinct, distinct methodological approaches. So on one version of these, the idea is that we're gonna get a complete theory of human action by just going bottom up. Let's go take a look at the mechanisms of the brain, whatever falls out of our best theories of the mechanisms about the brain and how uh, behavior production operates in the brain is gonna give us a complete theory of action. Um, the other way to go is you could go the other way around, right? Where you start as, uh, as many philosophers historically have done, where look, if you want a story about action production, the right way to do it is to start thinking about our, uh, our concepts Let's reflect on the kinds of distinctions we make about them. Let's try to test them for what philosophers will sometimes call extensional adequacy. So we're gonna see, make, see if we can get our concepts to, and our explanations of those concepts to link up with the ways we make these distinctions in the everyday world. And then by the time we're done with all of that, um, we don't need to talk to the brain scientists anymore. We can have given ourselves a complete theory of, uh, of action uh, that makes no appeal to brain science and is in fact even compatible with it turning out that uh, the only people who had brains happened to be people who were put in fMRI machines and that the vast sea of ordinary humanity never had um, a, a physical brain in the first place. We could still do a theory, of, a, a theory of action that would account for the robust everyday phenomena that we find in the everyday world, right? And so that's a kind of, that's a top down story about action that is dismissive of the need for for low level uh, brain science that gives us the bottom up story. And you could go the other way around, right? You could have this kind of view about, uh, look, the, the real action is in the, in the brain science and everything else is just a bunch of hogwash. Um, now, of course, notice that if that was your picture, then, a, a, then you've either got to figure out how you're going to get things like uh, free will and negligence and omissions and, and so on as a story in, 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 the, in the neuroscience, or you're gonna to have to do away with lots of distinctions that we use in everyday life. Okay, so no side that wants to be, you know, top, the exclusively bottom up or top down seems, at least to my mind, particularly promising as a story. And so I think what we would, should really want from a theory of action is to be faithful to both the empirical findings and our explanatory interests in attributing action. We need both of these pieces. So here's a, here's a kind of alternative picture about how these hang together. So, uh, so I think, look, we're, go we're gonna need both because both of these things respond to real explanatory pressure. So the, the bottom up, it responds to explanatory pressures about our, our being physical entities that are integrated in a physical world. The top down pressures uh, are expressive of our interest in social cooperation and coordination and the kinds of categories we need to navigate those sorts of things. And so I think we should just acknowledge action descriptions frequently have a social dimension. 
Um, and social and normative practices shape how we categorize actions, how we think about what's going on in actions. So, so it turns out action isn't just behavior. Um, action is behavior with a kind of symbolic content to it in a lot of cases. But at the same time, they're facts about how we actually produce those bits of behavior. And some of those facts percolate up into our practices. So I think, you know, one of those kinds of places where it did, I mean, um, so uh, some of you know this from the kind of history of jurisprudence, was the invention of mens rea, or the invention of the idea of, of a guilty mind. So this was not always part of, uh, of English common law practice. It was an invention that, as far as we can tell, comes about around round in the 12th century, where the thought is, no, 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 we have to start paying attention to certain kinds of mental states. Uh, and those, it's only in virtue of the presence of certain kinds of mental states that we can hold people to be culpable in a way that isn't just a kind of what we would now think of as a strict liability system. And part of what's interesting about that is that once you have a concept up and running like that, then it becomes a live question about whether or not particular people, whether they've got, for example, mental illness or addiction or what have you, have the, the, the thing that you treated as the target feature that is the culpability enabling feature. So my view about this is that, that a thoroughgoing explanatory imperial, imperialism in either direction is just a losing bet. We need both of these, both of these approaches. We learn things from doing the neuroscience that, that transform how we think about the nature of actions uh, as a kind of social practice, but simultaneously, uh, we can't get everything we want by going from the ground up because it turns out we still have to use some of these things for social coordination and cooperation, some of these concepts. Okay, so a, a handful of, of brief upshots. I'm inclined to think the power of neuroscience is in elements that are less socially entangled. So that is, these are gonna be cases where we have relatively robust agreements about how to carve the actional concepts. And so kind of paradigmatic cases to look for some of those things are gonna be things with, for example, notions of planned versus spontaneous action and the basic mechanisms of impulse control. So I think like th that's gonna be a place where where we're, we're going to need the empirical results in order to get the right account about what's going on in those domains. But I think it's gonna, the, the brain science turns out to be one input among several for the parts of a theory of action or agency that interacts with or are constituted by explanatory interests tied to social phenomena. And so here I'm thinking about kind of norm saturated notions of control. Uh, these are gonna be things like autonomy, freedom, responsible agency, and practice-based categories of action, like negligence, recklessness, and co coercion, like what those categories come to is partly dependent on our practices uh, um, and, and, what the, and what sorts of categories our practices demand of us. So going back to the very first question that I started with that John gave us about the difference between stretching, that looks like we might be able to tell a story about stretching without needing an elaborate story about uh, about the social world and, and, and coordination and cooperation norms as explaining what's going on in a bit of stretching. Um, as opposed to bidding on a Rembrandt, where there's not going to be a story about bidding on a Rembrandt that doesn't involve uh, a story about, uh, about social practices. And then most crucially for our current purposes, it's going to turn out that a directions to tell someone to please stop this talk turns on social practices, expectations, and norms about what academic talks look like. So on that note, I'll take the direction. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you to both our speakers for these inspiring talks. I feel very privileged being a grad student of both philosophy and cognitive science to be a witness to this dialogue and also to come at a time in the history of ideas where there seemed to be a real push for what Manuel concluded on, that is joining both the phenomenology, our first person experience of what things feel like with the empirical evidence that we get from neuroscience. And I think today's topic is one of many like free will action that we're talking about, but maybe also morality, maybe also the sense of self that are made a better, a greater sense. We gain explanatory power when we embrace this dual approach, as Manuel was suggesting, instead of just having one or the other. I already have a bunch of questions from the audience, so I want to say that maybe we can hop in directly into the Q&A. John, Manuel, is that right? All right. Great. So I know that somebody in our panel, and I will just start introducing the question, and then if you want to unmute yourself, Eddie, and go on from there, somebody noticed, John, in the data that you presented, 
In particular, the, the way in which the activity of your dopamine neurons were kind of ramping up and anticipating right after the cue, right? Anticipating the answer and suggested that that looks very much like a an RP. So is that an RP? How is it similar versus different from an RP? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I assume everybody knows, I guess you guys have discussed Bergius potentials before in this, in this colloquium. So um, and this is an old observation made in, in, in uh, Germany in the late 60s, early 70s, right about before the movements in, in humans, they were, they were um, instructed to you know, tap whatever they wanted on the keyboard. You see this slow buildup over mesial brain structure of the motor system. That's I'm sure you guys know a little bit about this in the, in the discussion. So yeah, I mean, it does look a lot like readiness potential. I mean, the difference that we have with this paradigm is um, we're able to, to reference it relative to something, which is kind of fun, right? So we can, we had to start timing cue effectively at the beginning, which means they almost get like a reset. We kind of see this like a little dip in activity. And what's nice then is you can separate the trials based on the open movement time. You can't really do their the redness potentials. Um, you don't know what you're referencing relative to, maybe the last time you pressed, I suppose. But um, so, you, so we're able to explain the variability when the animal moves, not just that it's ramping up before, before it moves. But, but I agree. I, I, I'm not at all um, uh, opposed to the idea that this is part and parcel of redness potentials. Um, we also, uh, we, my, my co colleague, um, uh, Gabriel Pine is here as well. Gabriel's um, with recording in, in, um, uh, in, in humans, you know, uh, preoperative patients for epilepsy, their recordings. They've seen similar ramping up in the motor system. We've seen it in monkeys and you know, in other structures, basal ganglia, thalamus, cortex. So a lot of the brain is doing this ramping up. What's fun about dopamine, of course, is, is perhaps dopamine, just speculation, perhaps dopamine is more causal in this process. In as much as when you use those neurons, you can't wrap up, or they're at least necessary, I should say. And we're able to influence the the the, the uh, both the ramp speed, um, I said, sorry, the, the, the movement time by stimulating your inhibiting node. But I agree. I think it, it looks very similar to the timing of brightness potentials, maybe part of parcel or even orchestrating brightness potentials. Sorry, Great. Thank you. And Aaron has a follow-up on this. What does the data look like when the animal is not about to move? Uh, is not about to move. Aaron, do you want to explain your question? Yeah, I mean, it looks, the, the, the data that you showed us were um, time locked to the onset of a movement, I imagine. Yes. Um, what do the data look like just, uh, uh, you know, ongoing when, when, when the animal isn't about to move? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question. So um, uh, in between trials, the animals are pretty busy. They, they, they squirm, they move around a little bit. And so you see, you see lots of transients associated with those movements. What's most interesting though, is they will make spontaneous licks just in between trials. You know, they're testing a little bit of residual juice there. And Allison, the student of the project, Allison Hamelos, Allison actually also average activity based on those spon spontaneous licks, whatever you want to call them between trials. And you see shadow of the same, same kind of thing going on there. You see this buildup, which makes us think that it's not perhaps, at least speculatively, it's not maybe specific to timing per se, but rather this potential process of self of self initiating. Let's say he is. But yeah, you, you can you can see. I mean, usually the baseline is pretty flat on average. But if you average um, uh, triggered on spontaneous work, you can see uh, certainly a ghost of that response can be seen much more clearly in, in, in the test. Great, thank you so much. We're going to switch to Manuel for a second. Walter, you had a question for Manuel. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Uh, sure, I'll just read my question. Uh, so I want, what I really want to know, Manuel, is what's the difference between a physical environment and a social environment? And why, why is that difference important? Because it seems that if you Make, you can make the same motion raising your hand and it has different effects in different physical environments as well as in different social environments. And to achieve my goals, I've got to know the physical environment as well as the social environment. And to explain and predict my behavior, an observer has to know the physical environment as well as the social environment. So why does it matter whether the physical and so whether the environment is physical or social? In both cases, it affects the outcome of the action. Uh, but what's really the important difference there? Because uh, I just wasn't clear about that. Yeah, so, um, I, I mean, Walter, you should know by now that if you want clarity, asking a philosopher for it is just a bad strategy, but I'll do my I'll best. I'll never give up. <laughs> 
So I'll, I'll do my best here. So, I mean, as I, as I think about it, uh, the, I think of the social as a kind of physical environment, um, but it's a kind of physical environment that arises out of beings that are capable of, uh, of certain kinds of distinctive features, at least for the, of the, the variety of social I'm interested in. So that is uh, creatures that are engaged in, in, uh, in intentionally cooperative activities and for which uh, kind of put broadly, uh, we can attach meaning and symbolic import to, to what we do. And so, so I don't think of it as an opposition between physical and, and social. Rather, I think the social is just a special kind of the physical. And then what makes it, what, what makes it special or distinctive? Well, part of the answer to that question, I think, has to turn on the fact that it, it's certain kinds of social practices that produce categories of action and produce categories of, of action significance. So one way to think about this is, I mean, you're, you were focusing on the success cases. That is in order to predict, um, it, for the actor to be able to succeed at doing what he or she wanted to do and for the, uh, an observer to, to accurately characterize. I think that um, th those, that's right about, uh, about those kinds of cases. But I also think that there, there are these interesting cases that fall out of social practice that are precisely about failure cases. So think about negligence. Um, or think about inadvertence, right? So the case of inadvertently bidding on a, uh, on, on a Rembrandt, um, th that, that's a, a case of a behavior, that's a, it's a kind of action that we can only talk about and characterize in a way that matters for our shared cooperative life, uh, only by appeal to and involvement of a certain chunk of the physical, namely the social practice chunk of the physical. And so that's the sense in which I think the social stuff makes a difference because it turns out that part of what falls into the scope of an action being an action and what kind of action it is works by appeal to this distinctive subset of the physical that is uh, meaning imputing and kind of symbolic import having. So, but I mean, you can inadvertently step on a snake or, or on a loose rock uh, and then that's going to make you get hurt and if you inadvertently bid on a Rembrandt, you're also gonna lose some money and get hurt. Uh, so I'm still not clear about exactly what the difference is. In both cases, you wanna avoid inadvertent behavior, um, but that can be because of the physical environment or the social environment. Uh, I, I admit that you know, they're different in some ways. It's not, it's not clear to me why that difference is important. Well, so the, the difference is important uh, the, the difference is important uh, because the, the, uh, the integrity and force of the idea that you've bid on a Rembrandt isn't in the concrete physical material conditions of a snake biting your foot. It's about a change in social status and then what we collectively are going to decide to do to you. Now, I think there's some sense in which, of course, that's going to have to go through your uh, and it'll interact with your, your agency in various ways, and there will be a kind of hurt to it. But uh, one way of thinking about these sorts of things, I think, I mean, so one way I think about what's distinctive about this is from the standpoint of categorizing what kind of action it was. So think of this as a question and action explanation. Um, so we, we can make sense of the idea of inadvertently stepping on a snake with the thought that you weren't intending to step on a snake, but you got bit by a snake. And that doesn't seem to require a whole, doesn't require very thick practices to explain. But to say that you were uh, negligent, for example, in, uh, in your conduct in some way or another, and that this is the grounds by which people can complain about what you're doing, uh, requires now that we've loaded up a, a, a set of social norms and social practices to articulate and explain how this category of negligence applies, even though you didn't intend to do something and there wasn't something that, you know, as, a, as it were, uh, in the um, non-social parts of the environment that does the explaining. So this is a way of pointing out that a lot of our categorization of action will go through the social, not as a way of denying the physical, but just to note that it, that's one way the, the story goes and that, and that those pieces turn out to matter a lot for our everyday life. Um, and so that, that's the thought about why we need it for a story of, 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 uh, of action more generally. Thanks. Thank you, Manuel. I have a couple of questions that seem to revolve around uh, the fact that there are also social components to even other animal species than humans and even simpler types of actions than the very intricate, high level cultural dependent 
um, examples that you give. So both Till and Tim had questions that aimed a little bit at that. If you guys want to weigh in. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to just so quickly, quickly the thought is um, that the, the, the kind of what an action is and whether it's a, a, a goal directed action or a, an action that makes sense and how we should understand it or a behavior. You could even you could begin talking about that by creatures like amoebas when they go up a sugar gradient that normally well, or a gradient, the heat gradient that normally um, uh, leads them to a sugar source, uh, but put them in a different environment and it just leads them to certain death. So how we understand the behavior is dependent on that environment. So is that fundamental? Is that, well, so are, are you saying this is more or less the, it's the same? It's just more complicated once we add the social or is there a, an, an added dimension that's fundamentally different to the sugar gradient? So, uh... So I, I, I dropped the my the sound dropped out on my end here for a second here. So till so I'm going to try to reconstruct what I think you were asking. Uh, so um, and, and if I don't get it right, then just uh, you know uh, uh, chime in. So um, so I think the the uh, so so there there's a sense in which I I, I take it that a and I think so uh, so I think that the the stories that are going to appeal to the social are supposed to be continuous with any story about the kinds of features that, or the, that says the following sort of thing. Uh, a complete story about action is going to have to involve some sensitivity to features in the environment and the way in which those features of the environment interact with the agent. Um, so I think that, that's absolutely right. And this is a story that is continuous with this. Now, part of the reason for leaning on the specifically social dimension of the story is because the thought is that um, it is partly as a response to uh, social coordination and cooperation uh, pressures that we carve up actional attribution categories in the way in which we do. And that will give a specific shape to what that feature is of the environment and how it is that the agent in the environment is gonna interact with that feature. Um, is that, a, 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 did I capture the, the question adequately? Okay. Tim, was that sure. a change? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll just follow up with that. So, uh, uh, Manuel, I don't, I don't know what you think about um, uh, distinctively human forms of sociality and on this question of uh, naturalism, the ability to incorporate human action within a, uh, a kind of physicalist uh, broader framework. Uh, it would be very odd if the only thing that was distinctive uh, and resisted uh, a straightforward mechanistic account was just choice that the phenomenon, you know, this kind of discrete capacity, uh, more plausibly, it would be bound up with something with other aspects of uh, intentionality of, of human uh, cognition and uh, the difficulty of embedding that within a thoroughgoing mechanistic framework. So it, it's, and so I think your sociality kind of points to it. Sometimes people narrowly focus on choice as this kind of very distinctive kind of phenomena, whereas this, this whole much richer uh, framework of um, human thought and language and uh, social engagement, the way it's mediated by those things uh, is, yeah, that, so that's not, not a question. It's just a kind of serving up to you, whether you have thoughts about that, whether you think this is readily assimilable as kind of Till was asking, uh, to the, this broader story that all agents, even of very rudimentary kinds of animal life, uh, are environmentally embedded, or if you think, no, there are really special, challenge, special challenges here. Yeah, this, uh, it's a great question that I, I don't have a good answer for. I mean, that is, I think, in some sense, it's, um, it's uh, so. I, I mean, my own views about this is that I think of it as a, as it's an, it's an open question, and it's an open question for which. Uh, I think for those who are sort of broadly naturalistically and mechanistically inclined, then uh, we should take this as a, uh, as, a, as a research project to show how it is that one can, one can go to build up a more rich and complete story that captures all of the features of shared intentional cooperative life. And I think that's a, and I don't see any from the armchair reason to, to be confident that it can't be pulled off. At, on the flip side, though, I also think it, 
it's we haven't pulled it off yet. It's a it's an open it's an open research project, and I also think that that there's enough. I mean, and apologies for the the the, the sophisticated technical terminology here, but th there's enough weirdness uh, to uh, to features about intentionality and consciousness and, uh, that I think. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, you know, or that it seems to me a, a, a live and reasonable and interesting research project to, to say, well, what if it turns out that we really can't get a neat reduction of these things? Or what if it turns out that this stuff is not readily tractable in, in the terms of uh, kind of third person naturalistic scientific processes? And then so then what would our best account of that look like? And so I think that's the sense in which, I, even though I guess I'm sort of, you know, my own energies are, I think of as is invested in a kind of broadly naturalistic project. I don't think that there's, um, uh, but but I think that's a kind of provisional bet rather than a uh, th than anything that we can can show that that's the right way to go. And it seems to me that our our colleagues who are starting from a different uh, different point, we we do well to have them as part of the conversation too. And I feel like the audience might circle back towards this topic. But before we go deeper into the metaphysics of it and how to integrate metaphysics into neuroscience, I'd like to uh, circle back to John and Adina has a question for you, and then a question from the audience. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I, I guess I'm interested in trying to uh, maybe connect the neuroscience to metaphysical stuff too. Uh, so with respect to the dopamine signal, I was trying to think about how it may tell us something about free will. And the problem, as you noted in your talk, is that it's just a correlation. And you know that you can, that it's causally effective in the sense that if you manipulate it, you can cause an animal to move sooner, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's really where the action's happening or where it's beginning. And so I was wondering if you had some ideas of uh, where you would look or how you would tell, and given that, you know, the, I think you were recording from basal ganglia there, is that correct? Yeah, also, yeah. Well, we record from the from the midbrain, from the snitch microcosm pack with the cell eyes are and also from the striatal target. And that's right. So because there are these cortical uh, loops that that yeah. you know you get a lot of feedback, you, you it's very hard to to try to pinpoint initiation. And I, I just was wondering if you had thought about, you know, how this might illuminate or not illuminate the question of real, real initiation um, in the sort of more metaphysical sense. Yeah, absolutely, Dina. I mean, all I can do is speculate. Okay. I realize uh, Gabrielle Prime has a very similar question. Maybe I have two, two birds in one stone here. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I can only speculate. I, I was, um, I, I, the only reason I ever worked in the basic game is because I started at Harvard quite a few years ago. They expect me to teaching medical students. Um, and I've been teaching ever since this course where it included motor systems. But I didn't know anything about motor systems. So I spent a summer teaching myself and learned about basal ganglia. And I was particularly struck there with exactly the motif, the circuit motif that you point out. It's there are massive feedback loops, right? Not just a basal ganglia, of course, basal ganglia that's right them through the various nuclei, thalamus, back and cortex. Peter Strick's work suggests it's almost point-to-point -point feedback, a series of you know, parallel feedback loops arrayed all the way from parallel cortex, all the way forward in your brain, with private feedback loops all the way to over from cortex. So it just struck me, it's an interesting motif, at least part of it in the direct pathway, appears to be in positive feedback. And of course, there's lots of other uh, recurrent circuits in the brain that also have that motif. So I've always kind of liked the idea, and I, I, it'd be interesting to try to test it sometime, that it's that, that one role of this positive feedback is to be able to spin itself up in a very nonlinear way, much the way sodium channels in a membrane can invent an action potential, right? Um, maybe it works at a system level as well. Now, why the basal ganglia? Well, be, mainly because of mood disorders, right? You can have damage to the basal ganglia or, or, or the main modular of the basal ganglia, the doping system leads to a paucity of movement, right? In Parkinson's disease. The opposite is true as well, right? That the, the initial damage of the indirect pathway in Huntington's disease leads to you know, hyperkinetic disorders, right? Things like that. Um, so it seemed like an interesting place to look. But I agree with you. I think if it's a if it's a feedback loop, any part of it in principle could be an initiator. It could be noise that arises anywhere in that, in that loop. I think that could be an initiator. And it kind of, it'd be kind of fun to, to probe that. So I'm not particularly surprised that stimulating the dopamine neurons could affect the clock. 
That's been known from pharmacological studies years ago. But I bet if we intervene with the same precision in, in, those, in those feedback groups at any stage, I wouldn't be surprised one can engender a movement. So is there, not, Gabrielle asked a very similar question, is there one part that's maybe particularly noisy that could lead to the movements? I don't know. Maybe it's an area that has spontaneous cells that are spontaneously active, perhaps. But I think that'd be some, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting thing to pursue. I, I, again, my bias is that if it's a feedback loop, you know, you could, you could initiate at any point with noise effectively at any point in that loop. Just a speculation. Thanks. And speaking of feedback loop and how different parts of the organism, broadly speaking, or the brains more specifically, could interact with each other, we have a question from the audience, which I'm going to read. It's a question for you, John. In flies, it has been shown that the internal state can actually cause a gain in the activity of visual neurons. Returning to the example of picking up the coffee mug on the table, do you think it could be explained by this, namely, an internal state of the brain, such as mild hunger or thirst, might cause an increase in sensory receptivity in the visual system. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question. There's not just in the fly, guys, there's lots of examples of this in, in, in mammals as well, particularly in monkeys. So these are often done in the context of attention experiments. You train an animal to, to um, I mean, I'm being circular here, but attend to one stimulus versus another. The key thing here is the way you get them to attend is they're, for, say, for example, rewarded if they respond to one stimulus but not another. But you design the experiment such that the sensory input's always the same. Now, that said, those kinds of experiments, they don't produce abrupt changes in activity. Okay? You can do that. If you, if you signal an animal overtly to suddenly switch attention, you can see it. We've measured this my own, in my own lab. But it's not as though it doesn't appear, at least, that as you attentionally scan around the scene, there are abrupt decreases in activity. So probably it's not adequate to you know, produce the basic burst of activity to drive movements, but certainly those, certainly those, 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 effects, those effects exist. But I think it, just, it pushes the question one step back, which is why do the attentional system happen to cause a surge at one location? You know, it, it pushes the randomness back another stage. And I, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea that the same types of random processes are, are also pertain to, to cognitive processes. Right? That the that the, certainly like the oculomotor system, there's the idea that we have attentional effects due to an oculomotor system that can only we only move our eyes to one spot at a time. But that could be driving attentional effect. There's 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 a there's um the, the same kind of feedback loops in front cortice. Maybe things diseases like schizophrenia are due to aberrant feedback, ab, you know, aberrant um uh, 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 feedback in, in in cognitive loops. So yeah, I, I um uh. I, I think it's a really interesting view of whoever, whoever the question was. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea, but it does, it does just back the problem up one stage in an interesting way. Like what caused the randomness of attention to one particular thing? It could be now, of course, driven by slow changes, like for example, in, in state, you know, satiation or thirst. Those, but those signals don't, you don't abruptly get thirsty, right? But maybe it slowly exceeds the threshold to, put, to, to, to push the system over. So I, I don't want to imply at all that these movements aren't, can't be triggered by sensory stimuli. Um, but but I, my guess is um, uh, the sensory stimuli aren't much stronger at that, at that level than the kind of the noise and the noise going on in the brain all the time. So again, just speculation. It's a fun question. And John, you talked about, about randomness and how we continuously explore our environment. And I, wasn't, I was wondering if you could uh, give us a little bit more of a sense of your theory on whether the, the brain is maybe scanning the environment in some sort of a random pattern unless another priority emerges. And it could be your blood sugar level that drops. It could be something that moves fast towards you in the environment. But maybe the baseline is this random exploration. Yeah, again, yeah, I, can, I can only tell you my speculation, okay? I mean, I love the idea that as multi-organisms that we build in noise. It makes sense, right? The first, you know, creature that got up and from the pond and, you know, walked over to the other pond to check out the pond stone probably had an advantage, right? The fact that it could explore. And of course, exploration versus exploitation is a big thing in reinforcement learning. I'm sure many of you know this, right? So it makes a lot of sense that you build in noise the systems exactly to explore to, even from a normative view of trying to just increase, you know, rewards and increase, you know, input, nutritional input on that, right? So I'm not at all, I wouldn't all be surprised. And, and, and of course, you want to, you don't want that to be the only, the only signal. You want, you want to have, you want to have, be able to respond to the external world as well. 
So yeah, I like the idea that it's a handshaking of, of internal noise and exploration, and of course, external cues and internal state, like, like um, you know, your, your state of whatever it might be in terms of your, your metabolic needs, let's say. I think all those things probably, probably you know, impinge. And I, let me just give one example. In, in monkeys, we did this many years ago, we did, a, we did a, a similar study on these soft time movements, but we embedded them with cued movements at the same time. It's kind of a fun experiment by a great graduate student named Erwin Lee. And the same neurons that showed this ramping behavior in the context of, of the, the um, self time movements, they were also equally, equally active, especially in the time of movement, when the movements were overtly cued. So my, my feeling is that, that whatever the circuit is, and this goes to Dina's question, we don't know what the circuit is, but there's lots, probably lots of points of entry to that circuit and maybe also noise in the circuit itself. That, again, that's just my own speculation. Thank you, John. Manuel, I'll circle back to you. You open, you put in a plug in your talk and somebody picked it up in the audience. You said maybe somebody is going to be curious to say if the discontinuity hypothesis was correct, then could there be any sort of cognitive theory of free will at all? So uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's an interesting question and it's not obvious to me how to think about this because one thing you could think that, uh, that I mean, so, so here's, a, here's a, a, a surely too facile reply, is you could think something like, uh, you know, but, uh, imagine, imagine it turned out that quantum mechanics and general relativity could not be reconciled. And it just turns out there, there's a, a fundamental discontinuity there that we can't explain, that we can't get rid of, that is just a persistent feature about our best understandings about how the world hangs together. It doesn't follow from that, that we can't do a science of quantum mechanics and that we can't do a science of general relativity. It just shows that, that how those sciences go, it turns out we can't, uh, you know, we can't get to the, the other theory uh, by way of what tools we have that explain internal to the, the theories we have. So I think there's nothing in the, the, in the concept of discontinuity by itself that would show that, that, that a, a science of, um, that, that uh, a, a science of, as it were, kind of, uh, distinctively uh, human cognition or the parts of distinctively human cognition that aren't reconcilable in, in, in lower level terms uh, gets, uh, uh, um, you know, would thereby be non-scientific. But I do take it that part of the motivation for some folks who are drawn to the discontinuity thesis is, is the thought that it's a kind of thing that fundamentally resists the sort of um, uh, the, the kind of uh, identification, intervention, control principles that uh, operate in, in, in kind of reliably predictable, stable ways. Um, so, yeah, so I, I mean, but I think, again, here, it, you know, I, I, I wait to learn from my, my uh, you know, from, from the scientists and philosophers of the future about how this is going to go. I think one way of pushing it that has often emerged in audience questions across different talks is something that goes along those lines and the question is for both of you. At some point scientific technologies are going to increase our ability to record multiple single neurons at the same time is going to increase potentially we could know all there is to know empirically speaking where would that leave us with free will and what pushes us to act and I'm guessing you're going to have different answers so please give us whoever wants to start Go ahead, Manuel. <laughs> well, so uh, um, so uh, so I'm, I guess I'm unclear about. I mean, there, there's different versions of this question. So one version of the question says we have a complete brain science, um, and then there's another version of the question that says we have complete sciences of the human across the board. So we know how they operate in social collectives. We know what sorts of goods uh, you know, uh, um, are in fact motivating and we know what, what kinds of social arrangements and possibilities there are and how those things produce uh, different kinds of goods. And so I think depending on which version of these questions we're asking, we're going to end up with, with conceivably different answers. So, so, and, uh, so on, the, uh, on the story whereby we have a complete brain science but all the rest is unclear, then I think, well, um, you know, this is unsurprising given what I said in the talk, I guess I'm inclined to think, no, this wouldn't solve the question because we'd still want to know whether or not, for example, noisy, distracted, spontaneous behavior, whether or not we count that as uh, negligent or whether or not we count that as inadvertent and not negligent. And that answer isn't going to be given to us, I think, by, by brain science by itself. But it might be given by a story about 
but which arrangement of social coordination cooperation practices uh, gets us whatever kinds of goodies we take to, to structure those practices. So if it turns out that, uh, that uh, on one way of arranging our negligence concepts, it turns out that kind of noisy, uh, uh, noisy attention grabbing, spontaneous attention shifting behavior, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's better in whatever the metric of that turns out to be uh, for, for our social practices to go forward that we count it as negligence, then that would be a reason for thinking it goes that way. So I think, um, uh, but I, I think it's also, I, I mean, it, there's a sense in which I think we are so far away from anything like uh, an adequate story about the, I, I, I like to fan uh, that uh, there are possibilities here how to think about what those future sciences will look like and what their relationship is to one another, that, um, that, that uh, speculation about that um, should retrospectively look comical. Thank you, Manuel. John, you chose to have Manuel go first. <laughs> Just being polite. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, look, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice fantasy that you could have, you know, um, you could be recording from thousands of neurons, let's say, all over the brain. And, and um, yeah, it'd be really nice. And, you know, I, I ultimately, I, I do think the brain, you know, that, that brain function is deterministic, obviously. I mean, I can't, I, I can't think otherwise. Maybe we have to get really detailed though. So maybe it's not just a matter of um, you know recording from every neuron, but we know there's noise processes on, on a level even smaller than neurons, right? There's um, things I used to work on like ion channels. You know, they they open beautifully probabilistically. It's so fun to watch single ion channels that are like little random machines, right, under thermal noise, and and you can get a cell firing spontaneously just based on a little bit of noise and ion channel. So it'd be, you know, the level of detail you need is probably much greater than say two single neurons, but it's a really fun thing to speculate about. I'd like to think at a certain point, you could get to the, to a stage where, um, you know, given, you have also have to have a good idea of the connections among neurons. That's going to be really hard, right? Um, even, uh, you know, all the kinds of models we, we, we use now, um, uh, you know, like recurrent neural networks, many of you are probably familiar with, right? They also, one of the most important things, of course, is the connectivity between neurons. That's been, that's really hard to assess. So we're, we're kind of in, in, a, in a position of looking through a bunch of keyholes and neural activity, but not seeing how the circuits wired together. So um, it's fun to speculate. Maybe eventually we'll you know, have the tools to do that. And man, I, you know, I put my money where I'm out, my mouth is I think at some point we're going we're gonna to be able to say, have a pretty good idea what the behavioral output would be you know, neglecting these other, you know, microscopic sources of noise. It'd be, it, it'd be a, it would be a fun time. I don't think I'll see it though. <laughs> so you're both hinting at a possibility for reconciliation and I'm happy that you are going in this direction. You know, Spinoza was saying it's kind of two parallel languages. Like you can have the star of the morning, the star of the evening, you're both talking about Venus. So maybe the phenomenology that I was alluding to when I introducing the Q&A period, the way it feels to us, this qualitative is one language. And then the neuroscience can give us a different account. And maybe they're both describing the same thing, how we get from one theory to the other, or whether we can't get to the next theory from one, as Manuel was saying, is as you're saying, something that the evolution of cognitive sciences is, is gonna shed increasing light through. One paradigm that I'd like to leave you with as a clinician trying to bridge this gap is what happens in psychotherapy, by which you only manipulate the thought, the phenomenology, the experience of the person at the conscious level. And yet, in somebody with PTSD, you might see that you actually indirectly manipulated the, never, the level of response of the amygdala, for instance, to a threat stimulus. And so it's possible that there is at the interconnection of these important topics, something like meaning, something like experience meaning, that is at the crossroad between mature neuroscience and a, a fully happy philosophy of the phenomenology of decision-making. I'd like to thank both of our speakers, thank the audience. This was a really interesting conversation and I'm sure it's gonna have stimulated a number of thoughts in our panelists as well as the audience. Thank you very much, both of you. And I wanted to let the audience know, as uh, we now started originally, that we are going to continue having this speaker series. If you're interested, you can tune in onto the website and you will find our information about future events at neurophil-freewill.org events.
Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.